right, now we're joined by John Grant, who is here for Yes on 1433. So go ahead and take up to five minutes to tell us why to vote yes. Great. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here again. I'm John Grant. I'm the Outreach Director for Raise Up Washington. Raise Up Washington is a coalition of community organizations, labor groups, small business owners, folks who care about lifting people out of poverty in Washington State. Um, Initiative 14.3, uh, we gathered 360,000 signatures from Washington voters to get this qualified for the November ballot. And we are very proud of that. That had the, it had the highest uh, validity rate. Uh, we really just turned out, I think, about oh, 1,000 volunteers statewide to get this on the ballot. So this is a very exciting opportunity to actually do something about income inequality in Washington State. What this initiative would do is that it would raise the minimum wage from 947 to uh, 1350, phased in over four years. So that way, businesses have time to adjust to that change. It would be it would get to 1350 by the year 2020. The second thing that this initiative would do is that it would uh, enable workers to accrue paid sick days. The United States is actually the only industrialized nation that does not have paid sick leave for its workers. And this is really a huge issue for all Washingtonians. 70% of norovirus outbreak actually occurs when you are going to a restaurant and a worker who's sick comes in because they have the economic insecurity knowing that they can't take the day off otherwise. This allows workers to accrue one hour for every 40 hours that they work, and this would apply to all of Washington's workers. This would be a huge step forward to making sure that our communities are uh, meeting public health uh, uh, standards and making sure that we have healthy communities when we go out and actually are uh, you know, going up out of town and going to a restaurant or something like that. So um, you know, this is a really big deal. This would actually expand uh, paid sick leave to over one million workers in Washington State. The minimum wage increase would apply to 730,000 workers. Now, we got to really do something about income inequality in this state and in this country. And the Northwest has been the leading charge against income inequality. And the best way to do that is to raise wages. This is our opportunity to really do something concrete for working class people in this state. People on the minimum wage cannot afford to put food on the table. They can't afford to put gas in their car, and they can't afford their rising rents. This would put, on average, about $600 more in a minimum wage earner's pocket. That is a huge deal. And that would help lift folks out of poverty that are currently struggling paycheck to paycheck. This is an incredible opportunity that has been supported by a broad coalition. Uh, the Greater uh, Seattle Business Association has actually endorsed this initiative. Uh, the Main Street Alliance, a coalition of hundreds of businesses, has endorsed this initiative. It's backed by labor, it's backed by community organizations, it is backed by a, a broad array of organizations to support uh, women and families. But one thing that is not talked enough about about this initiative that is really important is that it also allows workers to have paid sick day, or excuse me, paid uh, safe leave. Safe leave is very important for domestic violence survivors. This means that um, a woman who is, you know, trying to escape an abusive situation would not have to lose their wages if they're trying, if they have to take time off work to get a protection order because they're in a dangerous situation. That's why many domestic violence advocates have endorsed this initiative as an important issue to support women across this state and to ensure that they are safe. Um, this initiative actually just cuts across so many different issues, but we also have to remember that disproportionately. It is people of color and women who are working minimum wage jobs. And this is, those are the folks that this initiative is going to help most. So I urge you to vote yes. I urge you to uh, get out and actually knock on doors and join us. We are currently going out statewide to get out the vote. And we have to make sure that we win this in November so that we can lift hundreds of thousands of people out of poverty, protect women from domestic violence, and also make sure that our communities are healthy and safe because folks need to have paid sick leave where uh, we would be going you know, leaps and bounds from where we are currently without any of those kinds of protections for workers. So yes, please vote yes for 1433 and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have.
Great, thank you. So now we'll do follow-up questions. So Mary, Sarah, and Clayton. And <laughs> Michael and Joseph. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, a couple of math questions, actually. Oh, math questions. Sorry. Got to go. We'll do that. Um, 600 per month. I didn't hear you say if it was per month. Per month. I'm that sorry. That would be good. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to be sure I was right on that. And then I read somewhere um, that if we had kept up with the um, inflation compared to the 50s when the minimum wage was much lower, if we had simply added cost of living increases to uh -huh. that minimum wage, it would be above $15 per hour. Do you, do you know the figure that it would be? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, there's depending on the study, it's high as $25 an hour or two. I mean, the, the number that, that I hear that I think is most resonant is that um, in Washington State, you know, according to the National Low Income Housing Coalition, in order to afford a two-bedroom apartment, you'd have to earn, I think the figure is, is about $22 an hour. This is not going to um, uh, necessarily get us there, no. but it is a step in the right direction. And I think that it's important to note that this also once we get to that thirteen fifty an hour, the initiative ties it to inflation so that it continues to go up past that point. Sorry? Uh, my question about child's off Mary is so how do you arrive at the thirteen fifty per hour? Yeah, well I think that um, you know many people, especially in Seattle who are seeing the, the fifteen dollar uh, minimum wage get implemented, that we, we all like to see a, a higher wage. Uh, 1350 is what we think uh, will work in across Washington State. It's something that will work in rural communities. It's something that will work in uh, major cities. And it also doesn't have a cap on it. So if local municipalities want to go above and beyond 1350, this will actually make it easier for them to raise the wage. So for example, if uh, Everett wants to go to $15 an hour, they can pass a local initiative to do so. And now the, the jump from uh, you know 947 to 15 is actually quite a bit less and it's a softer uh, landing for small businesses that way as well. So does the research show that that's a livable wage in most metropolitan areas? No, I mean, we have to be very careful with our terminology, right? A livable wage is kind of what we were talking about. I mean, that would be a much higher wage. This is uh, a, a, a measure that is going to lift many folks out of poverty, that you know they'll be able to put more food on their table. I mean, $600 a month more I mean, that's, for some people, in some parts of the state, is, is, is your most rent, and so that's going to help a lot of folks. Yeah. Clay, then Michael. Could you, could you run us through the arithmetic on sick leave accrual? Yeah, so the way that um, paid sick leave works is that um, for, every hour, uh, for every 40 hours that you work, you accrue one hour, and you can accrue up to um, seven days worth of paid sick leave. And that is um, actually uh, the math of the way that works is that you can access that within 90 days of, of working, which is actually better than um, the city of Seattle's paid, paid sick leave uh, ordinance. It actually allows workers to access that benefit, which makes sense. I mean, again, this is a public health issue. People shouldn't have to wait 180 days before they can actually take time off work because they're sick. Yeah, thank you. Michael and Joseph. Could you talk about how this compares to the Seattle and SeaTac laws, and if there was anything that you learned from those being implemented that yes. affected this? I think what we learned from those efforts is that it's important to have a reasonable phase-in. And so this initiative will phase in the minimum wage increase over four years so that businesses have time to adjust. And I think that's a model that has worked in some of those other cities and where we've seen success. Um, you know, in SeaTac, it's not actually the entire city, right? It's just businesses that are affiliated with the air, airport work. And then in Seattle, it's all businesses, but they have a multi-tiered system based on whether or not there are um, benefits or tips or things like that. You know, this initiative is, is much more straightforward, I think. And I, and I think that, um, especially when you consider that, especially with tip workers, for mm -hmm. example, which are disproportionately women, when we have a, a terrible gender pay gap in this country, and especially in this state, uh, where women are getting paid you know, 73 cents to every dollar that a man makes, and this initiative does not have any tip penalties, 
for those workers. So folks are, are going to have, uh, businesses are going to have time to, to adjust, and there's not going to be as high a jump as 15, it's going to be 13, 15 an hour, but it doesn't penalize workers who are disproportionately women. And we think that that's actually a positive thing. And does that work out to a dollar a year for the next four years, roughly? It's 9.47 now, and then it'll be at 10.50 and 11.12. Essentially, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Joseph, did you? Yeah. Yep. So, um, so two disparate questions. One, do you know if any minimum wage increase and or pay and safe time has ever been passed on a statewide ballot anywhere else in the country before? And then the second one is, what would you say is the biggest misconception about the initiative? Okay, those are two big questions. Um, so the first question is, has this ever been passed? Has, has a, a minimum wage or paid sick leave effort ever been passed by ballot initiative? The answer is that Washington State and the other states that have these initiatives on the ballots would be the first states to do it. And it is, you know, there's an article in the Atlantic that came out recently that talked about why a lot of people don't like the initiative process. You know, a lot of people want the legislature to do their work. But I think it's important for voters to know that there has been a minimum wage proposal being considered in Olympia for over three years now, and it has been blocked. We came to the ballot as a last resort, because we could not make any progress in a deadlock in Olympia. So this is why we went the route of a ballot initiative, and we are seeing tremendous support for this initiative as a result of that. Um, the, your second question um, in regards to, uh, actually can you remind me your circle question? The biggest misconception. The biggest misconception. Um, the biggest misconception is that this is going to hurt businesses, and that businesses will shutter as a result of raising the minimum wage. And I, I just, you know, it's it's so hard to talk to folks where it's just a mental block that this would be, you know, actually good for business. But I think what people need to understand, right, is that when wealthy people have money, they hold on to it. When working people have dollars in their pocket, they spend it in the local economy. And one study has shown that if you were to raise Washington State's minimum wage to thirteen fifty an hour, over two point five billion dollars to be reinvested in the local economy. Again, why? Because when workers have dollars in their pockets, they spend it in the local economy. Sarah, you have another? legislatively a minimum wage increase that also brought their minimum wage statewide to thirteen fifty and then fifteen dollars an hour for municipalities like Portland. I guess my question then was just um, aimed at how you anticipate enforcing that, particularly with small businesses, but individual file complaints or what the I mean that's a really great question. I think enforcement is a really important issue as we've seen in the city of Seattle, uh, you know, enforcing the minimum wage and also paid sick leave. Uh, workers would have a right of action if they were being denied either benefits or um, or a minimum wage increase. And you know, I think we definitely would want to see a strong enforcement of uh, uh, of the initiative. But right now, it, it would be the same mechanisms that you would if you were not if you're being paid a sub minimum wage, like if you're being paid seven dollars an hour under the current under the current system. Um, All right, we have time for a couple more questions. Anybody has them? David? So, so uh, <clears throat> Macro says that, that uh, raising wages of all workers uh, uh, puts more money into the economy. Micro says that for any given business, there's a marginal cost of labor, marginal cost of alternatives to labor. Right. In fast food restaurants, uh, you know, with the digital money, uh, um, and the <coughs> marginal cost of staying in business or not staying in business. Uh, we have no idea what the $15 an hour experiment means in Seattle because we're at $13 an hour. Um, so I'm just wondering, you made a, a fairly blanket statement uh, um, that sounds like. 
uh, uh, but uh, is it truly grounded uh, um, in, in real economics of, sure. of business? Sure. So um, I've got lots of things to say to you. Um, <laughs> what one is is that the University of Washington was contracted with the city of Seattle to do an analysis of what the impact of raising the minimum wage, and you are correct, it's not $15 an hour, right? It's 13 or it's going to be 13 or so. Um, but what we have seen is that um, business is booming, right? We are seeing businesses open in the city of Seattle. Uh, we are seeing the growth. I, I, absolutely. And let me, let me finish my thought. Let me finish my thought. Let me finish my thought. So that's the macro. Let's talk about the micro. That's what you like, right? So the micro is small business owners have been lining up to enforce this. And the reason is, and we, when we've talked to someone like uh, McKinney Howell, who is the owner of the Plum Bistro here in Seattle, she loves this minimum wage increase because it has drastically reduced the turnover of her employees. And that has lowered costs for her business as well. And she's able to retain skilled labor. That is actually a really important thing that doesn't get talked enough about. And it's only when our small business uh, uh, endorsers talk to other small business owners that there's actually a benefit to this minimum wage increase, does that actually get communicated? And it's not just Plum Bistro, it's also uh, Molly Moon Ice Cream, which I don't know about you, but you know, I go to all the time, it's a great ice cream store, and you know, she's, she's still opening new stores, and she speaks, you know, she's, she's on our, our literature actually, she's right here, talking about why raising the minimum wage was good for her business, and is actually good at a micro level for small business owners. Again, that's why we've been endorsed by the Greater Seattle Business Association. That's why we've been endorsed by the Main Street Alliance. A lot of the fear around um, business, uh, businesses closing, it's a lot of this kind of the sky is going to fall kind of mentality. It, it kind of sounds logical, but it's not what we're seeing happen in, in real life. And in fact, going back to the macro level, business is booming in Seattle and people are getting paid a much more livable, not, not livable, but a much more livable wage. Time for one more. Anybody has one? Clayton. What do you think? Uh, what do you think happens after um, after the minimum wage is thirteen fifty, and we have a radical business downturn? I don't think that'll happen. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, uh, I guess what uh, it always happens. It always happens. So I mean, I think what will happen is that people will be being paid a wage so that they won't be stuck in poverty, right? And if we, and what we are seeing in Seattle is that the population here is booming, right? There is rap, there's radical growth in the city. Costs are going up as a result of that. Um, if there is, you know, a downturn in the economy, I mean, you gotta remember that it wasn't too long ago that we just came out of a recession, right? And how many of those folks would have been better able to weather that storm if they were paid a higher wage as a result of that? And um, I think that, uh, you know, businesses are going to be fine. I don't think that the sky is going to fall. And the study that came out of the University of Washington has corroborated that. It's not just me saying that. It's, you know, econ economists at the University of Washington studying the impacts of this uh, wage increase on a local level. And we think that the benefits will be, we'll see that at a statewide level as well. Great. Well, we are about out of time. If you want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. I strongly urge you to endorse and vote for Initiative 1433. This is our opportunity to tackle income inequality in the state of Washington. This will lift uh, over 730,000 people out of poverty and give them a wage that means that they can put food on the table, gas in their car, and pay their rent. This is also going to put a, a, having a dramatic impact on public health because workers will finally be able to access paid sick leave, which is something that is so important to make sure that we, our communities are healthy and safe. Please vote yes for 1433. Thank you.